Lord MP. My Lords, I wish to uh, beg leave to ask the question standing in my name on the order paper. The head of the Northern Ireland Civil Service wrote to the Secretary of State on the 2nd of May, providing her with a historical institutional abuse consultation report, draft legislation and a document which set out the key issues that required ministerial decision. The Secretary of State asked the Northern Ireland political parties to consider these important policy questions and to seek a consensus. She has now received their recommendations and will consider these as a matter of urgency. She is determined to do everything in her power to ensure that the victims and survivors get the redress they deserve as quickly as possible. The Minister will be aware that in addition to the head of the Northern Ireland Civil Service, as he said, all parties, all parties at Stormont have asked his right hon. Friend to legislate to implement the Hart Report, which came out in January 2017. As this Parliament is effectively lying idle, my Lords, for the next six weeks, can I implore my noble friend to prevail on the Secretary of State to immediately introduce this legislation on humanitarian grounds? Why should these victims suffer all over again because of unnecessary delay? 31 victims have died since the report was published in January 2017. Why should any more go to their graves without receiving justice? The Noble Lord makes an important point. This is about victims and this is about redress. The issue we face just now is that the original draft diverges significantly from the consensus reached by the political parties themselves. This will therefore take time to redraft. That is what has been taken forward right now in Northern Ireland by the, by the authorities themselves. Once that is done, it will return to us, and as expeditiously as possible, we will take this through both houses. My Lords, it all just sounds a little bit delaying. I have to say to the Lord, and I trust him implicitly in um, his judgment on this, but it's over two years now since the inquiry report. We've heard from Lord MP this delay comes at a very high price for the people of Northern Ireland and the survivors of that abuse. Obviously, the preferred option would be a devolved administration, but can I just put on record again, because this isn't the only example like this, that the government really isn't doing enough to ensure the devolved institutions are up and running. I have to say, perhaps if the noble lord was Secretary of State, we might see greater progress, which we all welcome. The political parties all blame each other for it not happening. And meanwhile, we have cases like this where people are dying, people are struggling for the lack of action. There is a a moral duty to act. Noble Lord said the work is ongoing now. Can he give a commitment to bring back that legislation to this House in this parliamentary session before any prorogation, wherever that may be? The challenge that we face right now, had the political parties in reaching their consensus broadly affirmed the Hart Report and all of its elements, then we could have been taking it forward right now. Unfortunately, there were 13 substantive areas of change which the political parties themselves wish to take forward, and these do require some time. I cannot give the commitment that you would like to hear today, but what I can say is that once we have worked through those things with the relevant authorities in Northern Ireland, we will take it forward as quickly as this House and the other place will allow. Lord MP is to be credited with uh, persistence in this particular issue, um, and I would concur with him that neither this House nor the other are preoccupied at the moment. And I hear what the Minister has to say, but people have waited far too long, and indeed there is time to do things quickly and effectively when all the political parties are on side. Will he take that on board? Northern Ireland needs a positive gesture right now. Isn't this the right time to deliver it and not to delay it any further? Yeah. The important thing to stress here is, were we in receipt of the, the draft legislation, I believe this House could take it forward very quickly indeed, but we are not. The challenge right now is for those authorities in Northern Ireland who are responsible for this to work through each of the aspects raised by the political parties to ensure that this can then be brought forward in draft. The moment it arrives here, we will be able to take this forward very quickly indeed. What I know, friend, except that there are other victims too, and we discuss them in this House, those who were brutally treated during the Troubles, many of whom were maimed, and many, many have died in the last uh, few years. They deserve the same sort of recompense. My noble friend has acknowledged that on the floor of this House. Will he try and bring in legislation that includes them as well? 
I would not wish to see these two elements entwined because they are quite distinct. But the issue to which my noble friend refers is very important, and I have given an assurance before and will repeat today that we must make this progress on the victims, pe victims' pensions question. And he has my word on that, that we will take that forward as quickly as we possibly can. My Lord, I certainly agree with the Minister when he says these are two separate and different issues, while still <coughs> extremely important. But do I take it from the Minister's reply to Lord Empey? Is it the settled position now of the government that since all the obstacles are out of the way, all the political parties are on board here to take action, that government now is going to take the necessary action, bearing in <coughs> mind that some of the institutions have a big role to play here and must not be allowed to get away scot-free? And I would urge the government today to give a clear, unambiguous, unequivocal reply here today that they are going to take forward this issue, and this is the settled position of this government, irrespective of what's happening in Northern Ireland, and since all the political parties in Northern Ireland are agreed that it should be taken forward. Uh, I can give the noble Lord that assurance. We will do just that. Oh, is the Minister Lord. telling us that the only reason that we're not able to consider this is because of a delay, of a delay in drafting the legislation? Now, the Minister knows I have a great respect for him. Could he not do something and go back to the uh, officials and say this House, indeed the whole Parliament, is ready to consider this legislation and put a rocket under them so that it comes here as quickly as possible. Uh, I will be very happy to put a rocket up them. <laughs> are, the government, are the government aware of the. Uh, Lord Rogan. Uh, the, the relatives and the victims of these crimes are grieving. The grief is, is deep. They simply cannot understand why Karen Bradley, the Secretary of State for Northern Ireland, will, has not taken a decision more quickly. There must be no more delays. And I must say, I welcome his comments today that he will expedite this matter in the most quick possible time. We can afford no more delays. So the moment we have this material here, we will move it forward quickly and we will see that justice is served and redress is achieved. Lord Lilly. I beg to ask the question standing on my name on the order paper. My Lords, the EU has adopted time limited regulations covering the aviation market access and safety certificates, as well as road haulage and international rail. The EU has also announced visa free travel for UK nationals travelling to the UK for short stays after exit. The Government has given reciprocal assurances in each of these four areas, which will provide certainty to businesses and citizens should the UK leave the EU without a deal. I thank my noble uh, friend for her reply. Since Britain may well leave the EU with no withdrawal agreement, is it not reassuring that these reciprocal mini deals and many others? mean that planes will fly, hauliers will operate, Airbus wings will be exported and visa-free travel will continue. Will my noble friend also confirm that HMRC plan no extra checks at Dover and will prioritise flow over compliance, while France is so determined not to lose trade to Belgian and Dutch ports that they have installed multiple extra lorry lanes <coughs> at Calais, located ex inspection points away from the ports and installed equipment to scan moving trains, so the likelihood of congestion and delays has vastly diminished to the obvious disappointment of the Liberal Democrat benches. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, the Noble Lord is, is, is right in that the mini-deals do make um, any potential um, exit from the EU without a deal uh, less difficult, um, but they are, as I have already said, um, time limited and there will need to be further <laughs> negotiations uh, one, when they expire. Um, with regards to uh, Dover, the Government is working to enable cross-channel traffic and goods to continue to move as freely as possible. Government departments have designed customs and additional control arrangements at the UK border in a way which ensures that goods will be able to flow into and out of the country and won't be delayed by um, additional controls. And it is, it is true that um, on the other side of the channel, the French customs authorities have certainly um, pulled their finger out and actually installed some additional uh, uh, control points, which will mean that the delays on this side of the channel will be uh, less. However, they will not disappear completely, and therefore we cannot expect, expect trade to continue precisely as it did before.
Let the Labour Leader, the Minister, say what will be the what will be the consequences for air and road haulage traffic between the UK and the EU under No Deal if further arrangements beyond the time limited period are not agreed with the EU, perhaps because we have, for example, declined to pay the £39 billion currently provided for on our departure from the EU? Well, the Noble Lord is quite right that there are uh, multiple mini deals and they do expire at different times and we will be looking to the EU to extend them and it is within their gift to decide whether or not to extend them as it is within our gift to decide whether or not to reciprocate and certainly any um, elements of uh, the arrangements surrounding our actual withdrawal will I believe impact on the, our ability to uh, negotiate these agreements going forward. Will the, Minister, will the Minister confirm that these are not mini deals? These are basic contingency measures that, as the Commission has defined them themselves, some will require continuing legislative reciprocity from the UK, which we have not put on the statute book at the moment. They will only cover a period of six months, and as the Commission itself said, that they would only provide for, I quote, basic connectivity and mitigate to some extent the impact of withdrawal without, however, guaranteeing the continuation of all existing air transport services under the same terms as that they are supplied today. And is it not an outrage that some candidates to be our Prime Minister will be receiving votes today by Conservative MPs who would propose to enforce this by suspending Parliament if Parliament does not agree that some of these measures are not in the best interest of our haulage or aviation sectors? Um, the Noble Lord can call these deals uh, what he likes. I would call them the, the, um, the EU Air Connectivity. Well, you, you, the Noble Lord mentioned mini deals, but actually there's the EU Air Connectivity Regulation, the EU Regulation 2019 509 Basic Road, Frail Tri uh, Road Freight Connectivity Regulation. But the key point about this is, um, is that uh, the Noble Lord mentioned that these uh, that will mean that the trans that. Uh, uh, transport cannot continue as it does now, but actually looking at the detail of the deal, it is substantially, it is substantially as uh, it is now, but the Noble Lord is quite right that were these uh, regulations to fall away, which they do on varying dates for various forms of transport, it will be necessary to look very hard what we do thereafter. My Lords, my Lords, my Lords, my, my Lords, does the Noble Lady, the Minister, recall the Government's written answer to me on the 6th of February this year? saying that if we end up trading on normal WTO terms, normal no, no. most favoured nation terms, no, no. EU exporters will pay us some £14 billion per annum, while ours will pay Brussels only some £6 billion per annum. My Lords, might some of that £8 billion annual profit not be useful in subsidising any unforeseen costs on leaving the EU without a deal, with billions to spare, no. for other national priorities. Rubbish. Unfortunately, I do not recall the Government's response to the Noble Lord of the 6th of February, and certainly uh, discussions of tariffs, tariffs are slightly beyond the scope, the original scope of the question uh, set out today. But we do expect that the EU's most favoured nation tariff regime will apply to the UK if, in the event that the UK leaves the EU without a deal. And Noble Lords will be also very much aware um, that this will result in the introduction of tariffs on 60% of current UK exports to the EU. My Lords, my Lords, my Lords. Given the, uh, given the uh, fact that the leading contenders for the Conservative, uh, my lords, given, my lords, g given the fact that all the leading contenders for the leadership of the Conservative Party have made it clear that it is important that the European Union understand that we are prepared to leave without a deal if we cannot get a sensible agreement. Would it not be sensible for the government to publish for each department what plans they have in place, how they need to operate and what future additions are required? Um, I'm sure, as my uh, noble friend uh, mentioned, that the, the, the um, EU fully understands that the uh, UK uh, is willing to leave without a deal. Um, indeed, it is the legal default, and it may be that we have no option. Um, it is also the case that the government is currently undergoing extensive contingency planning in the event that we leave with no deal, and further details of that uh, will be um, available shortly. My Lords, the uh, noble Lord, um, uh, Lord Lilly, 
said that the um, intention was to prioritise flow over compliance, mm -hmm. and I refer to my interest in the Register on these matters. Does that really mean that the government is prepared to tolerate unsafe goods, yeah. goods which um, violate intellectual property yeah. laws and everything else coming into this country yeah. simply to facilitate the mantra of no deal? Yeah. Certainly the government will not be tolerating that, and that is why we have designed customs and additional control arrangements to make sure that appropriate checks are made. Lord Smith of Hindhead. My Lords, I beg leave to, uh, to ask the question standing in my name in the order paper and in so doing make reference to my interests as set out in the register. Uh, my Lords, the Government has had no discussions with Phonographic Performance Limited about this tariff. Collecting societies are private commercial organisations, and the Government plays no role in setting their tariff, licence tariffs. However, dissatisfied businesses may have recourse to the Copyright Tribunal, a specialised court which adjudicates on the price and terms of copyright licences. I understand that the Beer and Pub, British Beer and Pub Association and UK Hospitality intend to make a reference to the Copyright Tribunal with, with respect to this issue. Uh, I thank the Noble Lord, uh, the Minister, for his reply, and I am pleased that this matter has been referred to a Copyright Tribunal <laughs> since my uh, question was tabled. Uh, it is estimated that the proposed new tariff will cost the hospitality industry an additional £49 million each year, increases which are simply unaffordable by many operators. <laughs> PPL collected £250 million last year and raked off some £35 million in admin fees, paying their CEO over three quarters of a million pounds. Would the Noble Lord the Minister agree with me that a better way to provide increased payments to copyright holders might be for PPL to cut their own expenditure? My Lords, it is not for me to uh, comment on the pay of the CEO of PPL. Uh, this must be a matter for uh, the members of that organisation. But I think it, all would agree it is important that PPL and PRS, for that matter, uh, get the best deal for all their uh, members, performers, composers and others who own the copyright and make sure that they get um, the appropriate amount of money that they are owed uh, for hearing their music. My Lords, I wonder whether the Minister agrees with me that there is a major danger of misunderstanding what is proposed and what is involved here. The new tariff does not apply to grassroots live music venues. It is designed to be fair to, fairer to small venues using recorded music, uh, will be phased in for other places, and the beneficiaries will be many currently underpaid performers and artists, my Lords. My Lords, uh, the Noble Lord makes a, a very useful intervention, uh, just to stress the fact that this is about ensuring that uh, those artists, performers and others uh, receive uh, the appropriate reward for their work. My Lords, I'm sure this House will agree that artists, especially the less well-known ones, um, should be paid fairly if their music um, is played um, in public. Can I ask the Noble Lord the Minister what, if any, are the expected consequences following the delay in implementing the new specially featured entertainment tariff, the SFE tariff, which was meant to be implemented on the 1st of July? And does he have any knowledge of when the subsequent independent review by the Copyright Tribunal will be completed? My Lords, I am not going to comment on a case that uh, is about to be before the Copyright Tribunal. That would not be right or proper, uh, nor can I help him on the first part of his question. But I think, uh, as I have made clear earlier, it is very important that these uh, collective management organisations, CMOs, uh, provide the best possible service for their members, but also do that in, and negotiate in a proper and fair way with the various um, in the main hospitality organisations that want to use their music. Brinton. I beg leave to ask the question standing in my name on the order paper. My Lords, we are committed to supporting carers to provide care in ways that protect and preserve their own health and wellbeing. Last June, we published the Carers Action Plan, a cross-government programme of targeted work. This included a 5 million carers innovation fund 
to encourage innovative and creative ways of supporting carers, we are also working with local government on a sector-led improvement programme of work focused on the implementation of the Carers Act duties for carers. I thank the Minister for her answer. As Carers Week draws to a close, I think we owe a great uh, a debt of gratitude to the 6.5 million carers in the country uh, who save us more than £100 billion a year uh, because of other costs that we would have to bear. But, my Lords, the problem is that nearly three quarters of those carers say that they suffer he mental health stress as a result of their caring duties, and over 60 per cent say they have physical health problems. Uh, can I ask the Minister, will the overdue Green Paper on Social Care put sustainable funding in place to properly provide support for carers and ensure speedy access to health services for these carers? Well, I, th I thank the noble baroness. It's an important question. I think I suspect that the majority um, of uh, the lords in this house um, have not only uh, been carers themselves, but have probably benefited from caring. I can myself say that I would not be standing here today were it not for the caring support of my own family. And we should pay tribute to carers up and down this country, without whom we would not have a sustainable health and care system. Um, I can offer the assurance uh, to uh, the noble baroness uh, that as part of the uh, work that is going on, not only in um, implementing the long-term plan, but also in preparing the social Social Care Green Paper, uh, putting in place sustainable funding to support carers um, is part of the proposals, but also considering um, employment uh, status. I hope that this is reassuring to her. My Lords, um, a growing number of older people are providing unpaid care at the same time as trying to manage their own health and care needs, in many cases co-caring for each other with partners, adults or children with learning difficulties. In particular, the alarming increase in the number of carers aged over 85 and over who of 85 and over more likely than other carers to be caring around the clock to be suffering anxiety and in poor health themselves what's the government doing to ensure these carers are getting the vital social care and community care help they need and are they still the priority as promised in the nhs five-year forward view um, I thank the Baroness, uh, Noble Baroness for her uh, question. Um, she is absolutely right that we need to ensure that we target uh, support at those who need it most, but we also identify those who are carers within the community uh, because of the burden that we know that caring can have on the health of those who are uh, caring. That is why um, the Carers Trust have been undertaking research into what best practice there is um, in identifying a carers and targeting uh, support, and also why the, uh, the um, uh, why the Department of Health and Social Care have been working with local government on a sector-led improvement programme of work focused on the implementation of the Carers Act duty for carers. Uh, we've just begun phase one of this and we're implementing phase two to ensure that best practice is disseminated across the system so that we can deliver on the commitments that we made within the Carers Plan. My Lords, uh, I'm sure we all want to encourage uh, stronger family life and community life and this is at the very bedrock of what makes healthy societies. But there's one particular group who do need help, and that's the 166,000 underage carers in England. Research by the Children's Society suggests that that's just the tip of the iceberg, and indeed that's a huge underestimate. Many of these young people don't realise they classify as carers. It's just what they've uh, had to deal with. It is affecting, in many cases, their schooling and mental health. What is the government, Her Majesty's government, able to do to help particularly support underage carers? The Right Reverend uh, Prelate is, is quite right to identify uh, this as a crucial issue. Um, the government believes that children should be protected uh, from inappropriate and excessive caring uh, responsibilities. We changed the law to improve the way that young carers are identified, and we're supporting schools to support carers and working with the Carers Trust to identify um, and sped, spread best practice. Um, but just today, um, working with the Children's Society, um, as he rightly says, um, we. Uh, who have led this project to identify and disseminate best practice, guidance and resources uh, will be published in order to improve um, and enable young adult carers to make positive transitions um, between uh, the ages of 16 to 24, and hopefully this will improve the outcomes that young carers do experience. My Lords, 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 my Lords uh, 
My Lords, um, I'm delighted by the Carers' Action Plan because it's a very important piece of work uh, for many thousands of carers um, in, in the country. But can my noble friend say exactly what progress has been made to implement this plan and how will success be measured? Well, I, I thank my noble friend uh, for this important question. Uh, the Carers' Action Plan um, was um, a real step in the right direction. It had 64 um, action points within it, and good progress has been made. There will be um, a progress report in July, uh, but some key steps uh, within that are promoting best practice for local authorities, clinical commissioning groups, and other providers um, in order to give carers much-needed breaks and respite care, which can be the difference between coping and not coping providing carer-confident benchmarks for employers um, who can identify carers within their um, systems and give them the support that they need. And, of, co and of course, the work that I've already mentioned, uh, which is the £5 million Carers Innovation Fund, which is to find more creative and innovative ways to support carers who are so crucial to our health and care system. My Lords, would the Noble Baroness, the Minister, agree that any future proposals for the funding of social care would need to be sustainable? And therefore, any proposals that requires the burden to fall on those that need the social care or their families will not be sustainable and therefore will require contributions from the wider society. I completely um, agree uh, with uh, the noble Lord, Lord Patel. Um, he is absolutely right that we must ensure that we sustainably fund social care. Um, the government has provided um, 3.9 billion more dedicated funding to social care, but we recognise there is a need for sustainable funding, um, financial footing uh, for um, social care as a whole, which is what we are working towards with the spending um, review. Um, but nevertheless, um, carers will continue to play an important part uh, within our health and care system as they do within our society. Um, and many people consider uh, that this is a rewarding and important contribution that they play uh, within their family and community, and we must be grateful to them for that. My Lords, the, the implication of what the Noble Baroness has just said is that the work around the Green Paper is focused on the medium to long term in terms of a sustainable funding mechanism for funding long term care. If, if that is so, and I think it would be fair, it seems to me the Minister could say something about the actual remit of the work. The question then arises is what about the short term? And we know, my lords, that the money that she talked about is a drop in the ocean compared to the money that was being reduced in social care alongside the increase in demographic pressures. So can she tell me, as part of the spending review, which I assume at some point may uh, occur, uh, that actually the immediate pressures are also going to be taken care of? Well, um the noble Lord will know that the spending review has not yet started, um, so I can't tell him what is happening in the spending review negotiations. What I can tell him is the work that has already got, um, gone on um, in order to improve uh, social care funding, access, giving local authorities access to around £10 billion more dedicated funding for social care from 2017-18 to 2019-20, additional 410 of new money to improve social care for older people, people with disabilities and children, um, and also um, £240 million more for winter pressures. Um, but he is absolutely right that it won't be any good um, to improve uh, medium to long term outlook uh, for social care if we don't ensure um, that we address the challenges that uh, social care is facing um, in the immediate term as well. Sorry. Thank you. Mentioned one group of um, carers. I'd like to ask about those from the BME community many of whom do not know about the benefits to which they would be entitled, the carers' allowance, for example, and even the national insurance waivers that come with it. What is the government doing proactively to support them? 
Um, I, th I thank the noble baroness. Uh, this is a really Im important question because obviously uh, the carers' allowance um, has um, increased um, and it is um, available uh, as a non-means tested uh, support. And one of the key issues that is being looked at as part of the social care green paper, and I can reveal this today, um, is um, financial support and employment status um, for carers um, to ensure um, that it is clearer um, so that carers are able to access not only um, all of the support um, that they are entitled to, uh, but also to try and uh, make it simpler. I declare it interest, uh, noble friend, as the former Mental Health Act Commissioner, and while we are talking about carers, there are a considerable number of people who are caring for members of their family uh, who have been suffering from mental illness and are now in the community. Would my noble friend not agree that we should be more concerned to give assistance there as well, rather than merely those that care for those with physical ailments? Um, well, I thank my noble friend. Um, this is um, an important point, which is um, the burden um, of ill health, anxiety, uh, depression, which um, has been clearly identified, um, which can be caused uh, by caring uh, for a loved one. And there, are, um, there is specific evidence about um, the number of hours uh, of the threshold which causes um, such challenges. And he's right um, that um, we should not only be identifying those who are caring, but we should be signposting them clearly to the support uh, which is available for carers and making sure um, that they are easily able to access that care.